My name is Wally. I personally suffer from anxiety and depression. As a young boy myself, I was told that big boys don't cry. And I think that there is some sort of preconceived notion that boys can't suffer from mental illness because they're constantly told that they have to man up or they have to be tough. And I think that we can all be allies in terms of creating a better environment for young boys to really express themselves. Mental health affects us all. Join the conversation on January 31st for Bell Let's Talk Day. Blog Talk Radio. This is One Child to Be Survivor to Another Restoration. Good morning. Hopefully you can hear me streaming. Uh, 7.30 here in the morning, 7.33, uh, January 12th, Friday morning. I'm glad to be here. And I uh, just barely made it in, actually, because I was having trouble getting um, into the into my um, my blog talk radio, st- like the little studio. So sorry about that. <laughs> I thought I had to play the whole song through. And... Um, but I hope you're having a good morning and a good week. So I hope the week was good. You know, my week was a little bit crazy, sort of busy and caught a cold and just uh, wasn't was wasn't even sure if I was going to be doing the show this morning. But I'm glad to be here. We're looking at a section on Havoka. It's uh, we're going to continuation looking at grief information, help for adult victims of child abuse Havoka H A V O C A, and so we'll continue on with that. And uh, yeah, just it's just really just a morning reflection. You know what I can do for you know myself just to help myself out. And I just hopefully it'll help somebody else out as well. Um, these are things that we can do as survivors of abuse, you know, just to take care of ourselves, to make sure that we're 
staying on our healing journey, that we're working towards healing, that we're getting things done, you know, what we need to work on. This kind of shows me where, what areas I need to work on and keeps me sort of going on it. So hopefully it's helping others out there too. And thanks for everybody for, you know, for tuning into my shows. I know there's a few people who are listening and I don't know who you are, but I appreciate it. And I, and I thank you for taking the time to, to spend with me. Um, yeah, so, yeah, morning reflection, really, that's basically what it is. And if you're a survivor of abuse and you're just starting out on your healing journey, you want to make sure that you're safe enough, really, to be listening to this sort of thing. So you have to do a safety checklist, and if you're not sure how to do that, you can get that information several places. But ASCA, Adult Survivors of Child Abuse, uh, Survivor to Thriver Manual, that's a great place to start. Um, it's online for free. You can grab it from their website. ASCA, Adult Survivors of Child Abuse, Amora Center Program. Just go to their website and pull up um, their Survivor to Thriver manual. It's online or you can download it. And their safety first chapter is like, um, I don't know, I always say 60-something pages long. I remember I read it a long, long time ago. I read the whole entire thing. I was really glad that I did. And this way you can learn how to keep yourself safe and whether you know to know whether you're safe enough to be listening to my show or anything like this, right? Because you don't want to be triggered and then have a miserable day and you know, you can really cause people to kind of go backward in your healing journey, which you don't want to do. And so you, if you're not sure if you're safe enough to be listening to my show here or anybody's stuff about abuse, you need to just turn the show off and make, and go get that information and learn how to keep yourself safe, right? And uh, anybody else who's listening, just listen at your own discretion. I'm talking about abuse, a very sensitive topic. And you just have to know that, you know, whatever's good for you to listen to is clearly your choice. So make the right decision for yourself, you know, and uh, – if you think the topics of abuse, violence, uh, domestic violence, or anything like that might bother you, then you need to make the right decision and turn the show off as well. So we're looking at grief, and we sort of covered the first basic, first little piece of it on Monday. And uh, we're going to pick up where we left off. I'm not going to repeat Monday. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry about that. I'm sort of I've got a, kind of a cold here. Yesterday was bad, but today's a little bit better. <laughs> uh, people move between different stages at different rates and can jump. They're talking about grief here. This is from Havoka, right from their website. You can go grab that from Havoka, H-A-V-O-C-A dot org. Look for their information for survivors tab, and underneath of that, on the left-hand side, you'll see there's a bunch of tabs with topical information in there, and there's one on grief, and that's where we're at. So we're on this little second part of this article here. People move between the different stages at different rates and can jump around between each phase. Recovery is more of a process than an event. So it is important that although talk of phases and stages seem very cold <clears throat> and clinical, you must remember that you are suffering inside and any discussion of recovery must be done slowly and methodically. Take your time and treat yourself gently. That's what I've done. I've just taken my time with this stuff. You know, it's like taking me 10 years to get where I am today. That's a long time. And people, you know, would say, well, I just want to be better now. I want to feel better now. That's always, of course we do. Um, you know, it doesn't, I just doesn't work like that as far as I can tell from other survivors that I've met and talked to and, you know, dealt with. It's a, it's a process. It takes time. And, uh, it takes as long as it's going to take. There's no time limit on it. It takes, it takes as long as it takes. Some people seem to just bounce you know quickly through these things and you know that's everybody's just at a different place and we're at a different stage right so nobody's at the same stage um so it's kind of you know you just have to it's you take the time that you need so i think that's very important so they, they have a little diagram here on their website it's five stages of grief um so they say normal functioning that maybe somebody could go from normal functioning um, and then to uh, a situation like uh, some sort of violation or like they were talking about, like, uh, uh, you know, categories of, of what happens to us in our lives. For example, it's been suggested there are four phases of response to being violated. Well, violation, of, what's that? Like like abuse. We're just talking about abuse here, right? So um, the first reaction is disbelief, right, shock, Um it can also be, this can be delayed, right? So people might not even remember they were abused until much later in their lives, which happens quite a bit. Um, frozen fright, right? Sort of detached, pseudo-calm. Um, it's almost uh, like the victim's compliant and appeasing. I mean, it's an appearance of cooperation, but that, that'll be confused with consent when the victim looks back on the experience. So it's absolutely horrific. Uh, the third phase is delayed, but chronic traumatic depression combined with bouts of apathy, anger, uh, resignation, resentment, constipated rage, uh, insomnia, 
the repeated replaying of events. Right? The final phase is characterized by resolving the traumatic experience and integrating it into the victimized person's behavior and lifestyle. So grief, I mean, it's a big issue for a lot of people, and I know, you know it is for me. I'm still working on a lot of this grief work. That's why I wanted to do this particular topic, because um, it's important for me, and hopefully it'll help you out as well. And the chat room's open. I did finally get that open. So if anybody wants to sit in there, I do check it now and then if, um, to see if there's anybody, if, if there's any questions or anything. Um, let's see here. So the five stages of grief, normal functioning. That's if a person was actually functioning normal before uh, they, before any type of abuse or violation or any sort of uh, traumatic event happened to them, right? <clears throat> For me, I just grew up in abuse, so my normal functioning was trying to survive in abuse because I just grew up being abused. So my parents were abusing their children many years before I was born and I just came along and I was just another one that they abused. So it's like I just grew up in this, in what was my normal, which was dysfunction and abuse. Right? So there really wasn't any shock. The The shock was just the initial shock of being beaten or whatever, being sexually abused. But the shock of living in a in, dysfunctional environment was not an issue for me because I was born into one. So, you know, it's kind of like this five stages of grief from somebody who was maybe normally functioning normal because everything was going great and then all of a sudden the abuse started. That can happen with people, you know, depending on the situation, right? Um, Shock and denial, that's the first issue. Avoidance, confusion, fear, numbness, uh, blame, any, any, any of those things. It's part of that shock and denial first stage issue, right? Anger comes in after that. They said, uh, you can look at their little diagram there if you want to. That's the next section. Anger, frustration, anxiety, irritation, embarrassment, shame, all that stuff comes from anger or is attached to anger, I guess. Um, depression and detachment, overwhelmed, blahs, lack of energy, helplessness, right? This is horrible stuff, absolutely horrible. I know all about it. <laughs> I spent my whole life in this uh, dialogue and bargaining reaching out to others desire to tell one story struggle to find meaning for what has happened and then uh, finally acceptance here exploring options a new plan in place and then a little diagram shows return to meaningful life empowerment security self-esteem and meaning so this is where we're headed through this this five stages of grief right and we're all going to be somewhere in here Anybody who's suffered from abuse or dysfunctional, you know, um, situation or upbringing, or it's just horrific what this stuff does to people. And um, so you're going to be sitting somewhere in here. I know for myself, like shock, uh, avoidance, confusion, fear, numbness, blame. That's not me because I grew up being abused, so I've never avoided it. Uh, I'm not confused. Uh, fear, fear. I guess uh, uh, some fear. I guess. Uh, Maybe fear of rejection, fear of anxiety, a fear of rejection, fear of abuse is always a problem for me because I'm always thinking that I don't trust anybody. See, so anybody, I, any relationship that I have is based on is fear based. Are they going to hurt me? Are they not going to hurt me? Am I, am I going to leave? Probably. I don't do well with relationships because of the abuse that I suffered. So I have, you know, this is mostly the fear. I guess fear of rejection. That would be my makeup uh, because I was rejected as a child and rejected then later in life and just of course rejections come up through life even as an adult you know um so that's always a problem numbness not a problem for me some people are you know i guess experience more numbness than other people i did think of my, one of my friends actually is a psychotherapist <laughs> which is really quite interesting and quite quite lovely to have a friend who's a psychotherapist or who used to who used to be a psychotherapist and um she was telling me that i she, because of what she's done with my healing journey, which she's helped me out a great deal, um, is that I probably did dissociate, right, for the CSA child sexual abuse because of being abused as a child and then the CSA took place and I couldn't deal with that as well as being abused. So I probably, she, she thinks I might have dissociated a little bit with the CSA child sexual abuse. But what's funny is I can remember it all, so I don't think so. Maybe part of me did, but but not all of me because I can remember the whole thing. So I was eight years old, so I was old enough to remember this stuff. See, so I numbness. I don't seem to have a problem with that. Blame, huge issue. You know, I still have a lot of. Of course, I'm going to blame the people that were responsible for the abuse. So some of this stuff goes along with it. Um, I'm not going to blame myself for the abuse. I had nothing to do with it. It was just a choice that my parents made. Bad choice on both their parts, and as well as my siblings, and one of my siblings who sexually abused me. So 
Blame goes where it goes. I have no problem putting the blame where it goes. That's why I wrote my books, and I'm out here speaking publicly about this. Um, because too often the survivors of abuse are the ones that are blamed for the abuse, right? Oh, well, if you weren't such a bad child, I wouldn't have to treat you this way, you know. Or, you know, if you weren't such a, you know, whatever, you know, people labeling children as if the children is the children's responsibility for the CSA child sexual abuse, which is incredibly wrong to say that a child could possibly provoke that. Um, that's absolutely ridiculous. You know, children are... They're, you know, they're not thinking in terms of adult sexuality. They're, they're little children, right? so there's no way that they could, that they could be to blame for somebody who's, who's made the choice to abuse them sexually. This is incredibly wrong, but people do put the blame on the children. I know that my mother, because my mother was the only one that knew about the CSA child sexual abuse, because I told her what my brother was doing to me, and she just basically then, you know, she was already calling me a whore anyway, but she used to call me all kinds of horrible horrible names and if for you know, I didn't even know what those names meant until I got older and then when I got older I thought why would she call me those names because I'm none of those things right? um, basically blaming me because my brother sexually abused me he was 21 years old I was like he was 20 21 I was like eight going on nine so it wasn't my responsibility not my fault and it's absolutely horrific this stuff you know what, what you know this is not 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 okay at all the next stage, anger, frustration, anxiety, irritation, embarrassment, shame. That's a huge issue for people. Shame, I just never really got understood the whole shame thing, and maybe I just don't get it. Maybe I carry shame, but I, I don't think it's all that much of an issue because otherwise I wouldn't be out here talking about this stuff um, and my own story. You know, I just I might be presenting information without letting people know that I was abused in any way, especially CSA child sexual abuse incest, which is horrific. So no, I don't think the shame is a problem with me. I don't take on the shame because I don't take on the blame. The shame blame thing, like I don't feel that it was my fault or my responsibility. This is my my parents were already brought up in abuse charges. They were abusing my, their other children, my siblings, and so it wasn't my fault. They just chose to. That's how they dealt with their children. It's not not okay, and. Uh, so, well, I don't. Uh, the shame doesn't belong to me. The shame belongs to them. Shame on them, not on me, right? So I don't have a problem with shame. Embarrassment is a little, you know, it's hard to discuss these things, and you know, with people, um, there is some embarrassment involved because it's absolutely embarrassing that, uh, you know, it's it's a, uh, you know, people kind of have a different opinion of you once they find out you've been abused or sexually abused, and. Personally, I don't care because I don't care what people think. <laughs> I'm like, whatever. You know, you probably don't like me anyway, so whatever. Um, it doesn't matter to me, but but it, there is a little bit of embarrassment attached to it because it's a horrific situation. You know, when you have to tell somebody face to face, you know, um, yeah, I was sexually abused as a child, abused horrifically, um, you know, physically, emotionally, psychologically. There's just a little bit of embarrassment there. Probably going back to my childhood when I was sitting in the classroom and hiding bruises and hoping that people, you know, wouldn't notice these signs of abuse around my body, especially my face and stuff. It's a little embarrassing, you know, and also just to be dirty in school and sitting there, you know, kind of showing up in my pajamas. Sometimes I used to show up in school to school in my pajamas once in a while, and the the, the kids would make fun of me, right? And so there was a little bit of I had some embarrassment as a child being abused as a child. So I have I still carry a little bit of that with me, but it's not a big deal because I don't care what people think, like whatever, you know. It's not my problem. It's it's their problem. So whatever. Irritation. No, this could be part of the anger thing. Anxiety, frustration. I don't have a whole lot of uh, anger stuff going on anymore, but I used to. I used to have a lot of problems with anger and rage, um, and I've gotten through a lot of that. But that's just the ten years of working through this stuff. You know, basically through Blog Talk Radio, <laughs> doing the work. You know, it's uh, it's helped me out a lot. I do work in the workbooks that I that I have, and I, you know, keep at it. Little by little, slowly, slowly, the anger is sort of dissipating. You know, I'm still angry. I'll probably always be angry about the abuse. You know, I was made barren by CSA child sexual abuse. Can have, you know, I'm 52 now, so whatever, I'd be a grandparent. But the thing is, I can't have children, never could have children. That causes me some anger. It probably always will. And um, just the fact that my mother treated me so horribly and I just loved her so much. And my dad, I really never cared about him, even though I did love him. I don't care about him, so I don't don't really care, like, whatever. But my mother, it was a huge issue because I just loved her so much. And for her to treat me like that, I'll always be angry about the abuse. I don't think there's – it's a proper anger. I think it's okay to be angry about abuse. Abuse is not okay. And uh, for me to not be angry about it, this to me, says there's something wrong with me. Um 
there's something what's wrong with a society that doesn't get angry about abuse. Abuse is very disgusting and disturbing, and it makes me very angry what my dad did to my mother, you know, what my mom did to my dad. They both abused each other, you know, in every way. Uh, what my parents did to all of my siblings, you know, both of them, and what they did to me, and then what my brother did to me, what my other siblings did to me. So, yeah, I'm very angry about that, and I think it's 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 okay. There's nothing wrong with that. I should be angry about it. This is absolutely unacceptable, and it can never be fixed. It can never be made right. Now I just have to learn how to deal with it, how to live with it, right? and that's what I'm doing. Um, depression and detachment, this is an issue for a lot of people. I know that that's where I was when I hit rock bottom, and they do show that as being the bottom, sort of as far down as you can go <laughs> uh, before you start going up, right? And I did hit rock bottom at the age of 42 and was seriously contemplating suicide, and at I had always been contemplating suicide. It's just part of our life. Our parents had set us up for that. So, you know, they were suicidal. My dad was suicidal. My mom was always talking about suicide, suicidal ideation. And the fact that she should have killed me, if she she used to say, well, I should have just killed myself years ago. And then she'd be like, I should have killed you years ago. So when she wasn't saying she should have killed me, she was talking about killing herself. So it's just something my parents talked about all the time. And my siblings actually were suicidal, some of them. Not all of them, but I'd say half of them were. And the other half weren't, but but I was one that was, and so I used to have a lot of suicidal ideation, just thinking of ways that I could end my pain. So I did a lot of drugs in my teens, early teens, pre-teens actually, <laughs> and then started doing a lot of drugs through my teens and in my 20s, and finally got off the drugs at the age of 22, I'd say right around 21, 22, and uh, decided that I wasn't going to end up in the gutter, dead from a drug overdose, I better just straighten up, and I also wanted to be able to work and not just live on the streets and end up, you know, just dead somewhere from a drug deal gone bad or something like that and I just had a feeling that's the way it was going to go so I my, you know my, my my brother who sexually abused me committed suicide that when I the year before I stopped doing drugs so he was a cocaine addict as well as he was just suicidal so I just thought yeah I'm headed that way I better just get off the drugs so I did so I'm you know I've been drug free like that sort of thing for many many years but depression followed me um you know through the whole thing and at the age of 42, I hit rock bottom, so really nuts. It was very disturbing. I felt very overwhelmed, like they're saying, overwhelmed, blahs, lack of energy, helplessness. And I just felt all of those times 250 million. It was so overwhelming, I couldn't even believe it. I was just to the point where I was like, i got to get help or I'm going to die. Yeah. And this is not good. So I made the right choice, and I hope that you will too. If you're ever at this, I'm sure so many of us have been there, and I'm you make the right choice. You get some help. Call the crisis line. Do whatever you got to do. That's what I'll do. I'm sticking it out because I'm not going to allow my abusers to win this fight. No, I'm winning. I'm winning because I'm having a good life and I'm learning how to take care of myself. They lose. They're dead. <laughs> They're all passed away now, either killing themselves or just dying of old age. And so, you know, I, I win because I find um, – I, I get peace in my heart. I get, I get self-love, learning how to love myself, love other people. And have a good life, right? So I win. Yay. They lose. Yay. And so, therefore, you stick it out. Do You make the right choice. You stick it out. You get some help, man. So dialogue and bargaining, this this is the next step. Reaching out to others, desire to tell one story, struggle to find meaning for what has happened, right? And that's probably where I'm at. You know, I've been been here for a long time, sitting in the dialogue and bargaining area, um, just getting help, you know, and um, and working through this stuff. Acceptance, is, uh, I'm, I eventually get there. Hopefully, I'm, I'm kind of in between this dialogue and bargaining section and this acceptance section, probably. We're exploring options and a new plan in place, and I'm working more towards the acceptance part. So I'm pretty well through my healing journey now. See, and it's a great thing. I still have things to work on. I'm still working on some stuff, but you know, I'm feeling so much better than I was, and I've never felt this good in my lifetime ever. Even though my husband's terminally ill, and I've got a lot of other things going on. Um, I've never been in a happier place in my lifetime, you know, so it is good to be on this side of it, but I know what it's like to be on the other side there at the, you know, through the whole thing and it's horrific. So you have to get help, right? Whether it's counselor, therapist, group support. I really like group support because I trust, I trust numbers. I don't trust one-on-one. I like the security of a lot of people. There's witnesses, there's, you know, I don't do, I don't like the one-on-one stuff, you know what I mean, as far as like counselor therapist goes. But for some people, that's perfect, right? So you do whatever it takes for you. You do whatever you need to get help, right? But make sure that you do get some help. And then, uh, so yeah, and then working towards this return to meaningful life. I've never came from a meaningful life, and so it's not a return for me. 
um, it's just a first step. It's the first time, right? So for me, I grew up being abused in this horrific situation, just watching people hurt each other, try to kill each other, just emotionally, psychologically, you know, verbally, physically try to destroy each other. That's just how I grew up. Now it's like now I'm learning how to live this normal, decent life, you know, where people treat people decently and I'm going to treat people decently and I expect to be treated decently like a decent human being and with human rights afforded to me that I would give to somebody else, just accepting myself, accepting accepting this life, you know, it's it's been a, a struggle <clears throat> and a journey, you know, it's been incredibly hard. And so for, you know, for anybody out there, it doesn't happen overnight, unfortunately. I wish that it did, right, but unfortunately it doesn't. So they stay here underneath of that denial. That's kind of quote unquote nothing happened, right? That's just denial, denying the whole thing. Bargaining, something happened, but you know, bargaining can be something like um, an issue where somebody might take the blame on, saying, "Well, something happened, but you know, quote unquote, maybe I caused it." A lot of times, especially in domestic violence situations, the person who's in who's the victim of the whole thing quite often will take the blame on and say, "Well, if I wouldn't have done this, then he or she, whoever." wouldn't have had to, to hurt me, see. Because this is in their mind that they must have done something wrong for this to happen, right? I know with the CSA child sexual abuse, I did some of that. Because I was like, well, well, why would my brother do this to me, you know? Why would he hurt me and sexually rape me and sodomize me? And I mean, what did I do? Maybe, you know, what I, I kind of, <clears throat> as if it could be my fault, you know? Like, there's no way. Then as an adult, I'm like, oh, no. No, I did absolutely nothing wrong. I used to love my brother, and then I hated him. And today, do I still hate him? Yes, absolutely I do. And uh, that's a proper thing, I think. You know, can't, How can you love somebody that hurts you like that? No, never. And my parents, you know, I don't hate them, but I hate what they did. And that's incredibly wrong what they did. So, yeah, I still have some, you know, and I think it's, it's okay because I'm not going to ever um, say that what they did was okay. That's just never going to come out of my lips. <laughs> You know, I'm never going to ever say that my, what my brother did to me um, was okay, sexually abusing me, or that my parents, what they did was okay. No, they what that stuff was not okay, so I'm not going to turn it around and make it some sort of, it's okay. It's like, no, no, it was not okay. <laughs> but I have to be okay with me, and this is where the draw, I have to draw the line. I have to be okay with me. Even though all that stuff happened to me, I have to be okay with me. See? So that's the issue. That's working on being okay with myself. And knowing that, yeah, this stuff happened to me, but I don't have to let it destroy me. And that's a huge issue. So it's like, you know, it's good. It's good to see the truth and reality instead of just saying, oh, I have to learn to be okay with it. It's like, no, I'll never be okay with the abuse. Never. Right. Um, anger, something bad happened and I don't like it. That's some, that's a quote unquote there. Sadness, something happened and it cost me a lot. Uh, acceptance, acceptance, forgiveness, something happened and I have I have healed from it. So this is just their little blurbs on this whole thing. They said, coming to terms with your grief isn't going to be easy. A good way to begin is by reading this section and learning about each stage, then then perhaps make entries about your thoughts and feelings in a journal. I do journal, and actually don't do enough of it, but I used to journal quite a bit. A journal will help you express your thoughts so that you can develop your feelings. If you feel this is unnatural, you can talk to a loved one or a therapist. We strongly recommend you seek professional help, and you can use our section on choosing a therapist to help you decide. So this is what they're saying here. So Havoka.org, that's where this came from. And yeah, we only have about a minute left, so we won't have time to do the other stuff, but we'll pick that up next, like Monday. And how about a brainy quote? I would say get some help this weekend. If you're struggling and you're having trouble, you call a crisis line, but you get some help. You don't, you don't do not suffer on your own. And you get a hold of somebody. Get a hold of NASCA members. NASCA members are survivors of abuse, N-A-A-S-C-A. That's National Association of Adult Survivors of Child Abuse. There's so many people that are there that are willing to be there for you. And you just call somebody. You get help. You do not allow yourself to be destroyed by this, right? And um, you can get help for uh, if, you're, if you're having trouble coping from IrvingStudios.com, Child Abuse Survivor Monument. Um, creating containment boundaries and stuff like that. So, on the you know, if you need any information, get a hold of me. I've got lots and lots of information. Um, how about this one? We should not give up and we should not allow the problem to defeat us. That's APJ Abdul Kalam. That's from Bar uh, Brady Quote. We should not give up and we should not allow the problem to defeat us. 
That's awesome. So I wish you a wonderful weekend. You take good care of yourself. That's the best thing you could ever do. Be good to yourself and, you know, be good to those around you. And I hope you have a wonderful weekend. And we'll talk to you guys. Um, I should be around on Monday. Take good care.